Hello, and welcome to the launch webinar for Whiteness Rules, Racial Exclusion in Becoming an American College President. I will introduce our panelists momentarily, and they will provide for you an introduction to the work and speak to why it matters, share some information about the findings and the solutions, and then turn to ideas for advancing policy and process changes. We are saving plenty of time to hear questions from you, our attendees, you are currently muted during the webinar so that we can hear our presenters, so please do send in those questions and comments via the Q&A tab in your Zoom toolbar. We will gather them and get to as many as we possibly can during the conversation. Our attendees today include higher education leaders, researchers, technical assistance providers, foundations, journalists, executive search firms, and more, so lots of brain power today on the call. Thank you for being here and we want to hear your questions as well as your thoughts regarding how to ensure that the solutions to this issue are taken up. Next slide. So our panelists today are Eloy Ortiz Oakley, President and CEO of College Futures Foundation, Dr. Estela Bensimon, President of Bensimon and Associates, Dr. Megan Chase, who is part of the research team at Ben Simone and Associates, Dr. Cheryl Ching, who is also part of Ben Simone and Associates team, Michelle Siqueiros, president of Campaign for College Opportunity, and then we also have Dr. Ramon Liera and Dr. Raquel Rall, who are part of the Ben Simone and Associates team and will be joining us during the Q&A. I'm your host, Regan Douglas. I'm the Director of Strategic Communications at College Features Foundation. You saw the agenda we had up earlier, so we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. Um, but first, we're going to start with Eloy Ortiz Oakley, who's going to talk to us about this research, frame it up, the impetus behind it. And then we're going to move to Dr. Ben Simone, who's going to share with us um, some deeper information about the project. So Eloy, turning it over to you. Happy Halloween and um, happy Monday. Thank you all for being with us, for joining us here at College Futures. This is a very important topic, um, and I'm going to try to keep my comments short to turn it over to the people who have a lot to say about the work that we're about to unveil. But we here at College Futures feel that this is critical work. It's critical not just for California, but for the entire country, uh, for all of us in higher education. And the timing couldn't be more important as well. Um, not only uh, do we have two very important searches going on here in California at the California State University System and at the California Community Colleges, but as you all know, there are some important topics about diversity being argued uh, before the Supreme Court as we speak. So diversity um, is top of mind in higher education across the country, and this report dives deep into that very topic. I want to also thank uh, Monica Lozano, our former president of College Futures, for getting this work started for the entire team, and of course to Ben Simone Associates, who uh, authored this work. So for us at College Futures, this is not just about a report on diversity, this is about student success. This is about our students in California and throughout the country being able to see themselves represented in the leaders that are on campuses. Because we know that diversity on campus leads to greater student success for all students, not just for students of color or other representative groups, for all students. So for California, this is critical for us to continue to grow and to create the access and the opportunity we wanna see for Californians. We need to see the leadership reflect the experiences of the students that we serve. So we're gonna be talking a lot about this report in the coming months. Uh, we're gonna be asking you to work with us, uh, to continue to uh, push forward, uh, to work with local community college boards of trustees, with CSU campuses, with the with the 
leadership of all the systems in California to get this message across. Our students in California deserve to see themselves represented in leadership. Uh, so I thank you all for joining us today. Um, and again, um, this is not just about California. This has far reaching impacts throughout the nation because as you know, um, just the two systems I mentioned alone, alone serve the bulk of undergraduates in the country. So it's critically important, not just for California, but for the nation. So let me step out of the way and let the people who actually uh, looked into this issue pull together their support, as well as a toolkit to help guide us on how to improve hiring, recruiting, and um, uh, hiring itself. Uh, let me turn it over to somebody who needs no introduction, but I will introduce her anyway, because she is a champion of equity here in California, someone that we've worked with for many, many years, um, is Dr. Estella Ben Simon. I will turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Eloy. Good morning, and thank you for joining us to learn about our report, Whiteness Rules, Racial Exclusion in Becoming an American College President. I am very grateful to College Futures Foundation for its support and partnership in this work. In particular, we are indebted to Monica Lozano, the former president and chief executive officer of College Futures, she had the foresight and courage to question normative practices in the search and selection of college presidents here in California. Her unrelenting commitment to eliminating discriminatory practices that negatively impact candidates of color empowered me and the research team to reframe search and selection processes as race conscious. Of course, we're also grateful to Eloy Ortiz Oakley, the newly appointed Chief Executive Officer and President of College Futures for his great support. We really look forward to collaborating with you to create opportunities to implement the reforms recommended in whiteness rules. On behalf of the research team, I want to thank the University of California, California State University, and California Community College System Heads for their support of the project. Whiteness Rules is based on a year-long study of how college presidents and chancellors are searched for and selected in the three sectors of California's public higher education system. But before we get into the details of the report, I want to explain why we named it Whiteness Rules. We are aware that calling out whiteness to describe the search and selection processes for college presidencies is provocative. And some may misunderstand that to signify anti-whiteness. We paired the concept of whiteness with rules to illustrate two features of presidential search and selection processes that work against efforts to make the profile of California's college presidents and chancellors more reflective of the racial diversity of the state, and in particular, the, state, the students who go to our three systems. In the report, we illustrate how the rules, that, you know, that is the norms that govern who is qualified for a college presidency unjustly advantage white candidates. Explicitly, the kinds of desired qualifications and preferable experiences, and implicitly, the prestige of undergraduate and graduate degrees, as well as the status of the discipline in which the degree was earned, served to rule out Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and Asian American and Pacific Islanders as viable candidates. I know that some will point to existing precedents of color as examples of the system working as it should be. But the error in that thinking was revealed to us with the discovery of a clear pattern of forcing both candidates and presidents of color to conform to a traditional white male standard 
for these positions, with an insistence, obviously not stated directly, that candidates of color follow the rules of white expectations. Presidents of color reported feeling that they risked not getting the job if they strayed from these white norms. They felt very aware of not showing up to ethnic. This covers a range of white expectations, including those around vocabulary and speech patterns and accents and cultural values, as well as fashion choices, such as no big hair or chunky jewelry, which was especially true of women of color. There is an expectation to perform whiteness, which is necessary not only to meet white expectations, but most of all, to make the selection of candidates of color not appear to be a risk. Our findings indicate that for candidates of color, their evaluation is not only about whether they're qualified leaders that can successfully serve the campus, but also about how closely they can approximate the cultural, linguistic, and social practices of whiteness. The more they fit within the traditional image of college president, the greater their likelihood of being viewed as viable for the role. This is an uncomfortable discovery, and some in the higher levels of college administration and governance will be inclined to dismiss it. Whiteness is still not recognized for what it is, a valued credential granting extra points to those who possess it. What is notable about this is that in discussions about higher education's failure to diversify faculty and leadership, whiteness has rarely been implicated. The failure to attain racial equity in selecting an appointment and appointing faculty and leaders is typically attributed to not casting the net widely, the lack of candidates who have the requisite experience. In other words, the lack of those who have passed the social, political, and cultural filters. Or it may be attributed to simply a lack of interest among uh, people of color to become college presidents. Our report lays bare all the ways in which whiteness is embedded at every stage of presidential search and selection processes here in California and I am sure in the rest of the country. Attempted remedies have consistently failed because they leave the architecture of the presidential search and appointment process intact. Our report describes eight ways in which presidential searches are racialized. But we don't just describe the problems, we do a lot more than that. We also provide solutions by way of a set of tools to transform presidential search processes with race at the center. The long-standing rules of presidential searches were created at a time when higher education was predominantly white, and they have continued reproducing whiteness in the college presidents. To break this cycle, it is clear that we must break those outdated and inequitable rules. This may be difficult for some to accept, but as someone who has spent much of my life challenging and breaking rules, I am certain that we must do so if we are ever to end this cycle of whiteness. Now, I invite you to hear from Drs. Cheryl Ching and Megan Chase about the details of our findings and the toolkit that we developed to replace the outdated architecture of search and selection processes. Thank you very much. All right, thank you, Estella, and good morning, everyone. I think this, will the slides come on, come back up now? Okay, great. Yeah, here's an overview of our findings, um, and we can go to the next slide. All right, great. So again, thank you, Estella. So given what we've learned from our research that Estella has so nicely summarized, um, 
what can we do? Next slide, please. So you wanna underscore that the solutions that we need to decenter white rules and presidential search are not more of the same, not more outreach, not more mentoring, not more training, and certainly not more elitism. You know, some of these things might be necessary, but they're certainly not sufficient. Presidential outcomes, as our report shows, continue to, we continue to see a racial mismatch between who is in the presidency and who our students are. And presidential outcomes continue to show that white rules have kept the college presidency too white, too male for far too long. And we also can't just focus on the presidential level because the majority of presidents continue to come from the quote unquote traditional academic pathway. Thus, we also need to focus on and embed racial equity in who becomes faculty, department chairs, deans, and the provosts. Ultimately, we do need to do something fundamentally different. Otherwise, we're going to get the same results. And by something different, we need to change key aspects of the search process, how things are done, who is involved, and what, especially what criteria and standards are used to determine qualification and fit. And we certainly need to change the pathways towards becoming a quote unquote viable candidate in presidential searches. Uh, next slide, please. So as Estella mentioned, we developed a toolkit that builds on our findings, as well as research on racial equity and diversity in hiring, as well as practices that are being implemented in California and elsewhere. So we created these tools to initiate and jumpstart change in hiring, but we want to emphasize that this toolkit is not a miracle worker, nor does it cover all aspects of the selection process that need work. For example, we know that system offices play a big role in presidential hiring, but we don't actually have a specific tool that takes direct aim at the work of the system office. We also want to emphasize thus that this toolkit is really just a place to start. It's a source of ideas, a guide that focuses on five main dimensions of presidential search that we believe is crucial for changing the white rules that underpin searches now. We also hope that the toolkit will offer tools that you could see implementing in your institution's next search, as well as ideas that you can use to change existing rules and procedures. We also understand that you may think that some ideas don't or can't apply to your institution, and that's fair. But if you come to that conclusion, we ask that you be explicit and articulate why the idea doesn't or cannot work at this time, and not to just dismiss the ideas out of hand. We can't stress enough how important race conscious engagement of all stakeholders is for change, and we cannot check box our way to racial equity in presidential hiring. So what these tools are, are a potential to disrupt white rules, a potential, but people really need to make that disruption real. Next slide, please. So what we have on this slide is an overview of our tools, like a kind of quick glance. We have one that focuses on search firms. We have three that target the work of search committees and a fifth tool that covers the job announcement. As well as at the end of the toolkit, we also have additional recommendations that address other aspects of the search process. For example, critically race conscious and equity minded training for boards of trustees. Um, and now I'm actually gonna turn it over to um, Dr. Megan Chase who will walk us through a high level view of one of the tools. Great, thank you, Cheryl. Um, thank you for that introduction to the toolkit, its purpose and use. I'm going to quickly provide an overview of what you can expect to see uh, for each tool. Uh, to do so, I'm gonna use one of our tools like Cheryl had mentioned, tool four, uh, to demonstrate. So as Cheryl mentioned, we have several tools that specifically speak to search committees because who's on a committee, the training that they receive and the work that they do is critical for creating a race conscious process. So tool four is specific to the work that the search committee does. Um, advance slide, please. So again, in showing you a small piece of one tool, we hope to orient you to what is included within each tool. I wanna underscore that the tools and recommendations provided are different from typical strategies to diversify the presidency. They are not about strategies to diversify the pool or to support more racially minoritized individuals or females into the leadership pipeline, but more so, 
How can the processes and the work of those involved play a role in racially equitizing the presidency? How can the system change? It requires a different lens. Taking what has always been done in the current practice and asking, how can this process be more race conscious and how can we center race? Uh, next slide, please. So within each tool, you will find an intro section that provides a rationale for why we are focusing on the topic. For example, for tool four, the rationale to focus on the work of the search committee is because the core of the work of the search committee is critical to who is selected, meaning the work of narrowing down the pool for an interview and then who moves forward. Additionally, this area merits attention because often the work of search committees are, are done behind closed doors, which can increase the chance of discussions that are raced and gendered as our findings have indicated. And also that search committees are made up of various stakeholders where power dynamics play out and who is ultimately recommended to the board. Next slide, please. For each tool, there is an explanation of what it is composed of. In this case, there are seven recommendations that are part of tool four. They get at how to establish race conscious rubrics to review things like cover letters, CVs, to select semi-finalists as well as ultimately the finalists. Tool four also provides recommendations for how to create a list of equity-minded leadership qualifications, race conscious interview questions, as well as creating equity checkpoints at each point of the search committee process. Each tool is also specifically um, specifically references who the audience for the tool is. So for example, this tool, the audience is the search committee. Then each recommendation is delineated with examples to get administrators, faculty, and staff started on the road to reimagining these pieces of their process. Another unique component and feature of the toolkit is that each recommendation within each tool has a section on how the recommendation and our tool advances racial equity. Next slide, please. So to illustrate how this particular tool can be utilized, I'm going to use recommendation three from tool four, which is on page 28 of the toolkit. The recommendation is to expand qualified leadership pathways and center equity mindedness in candidate qualifications. So as mentioned, one of the critical findings from this report is the tendency for strict adherence to traditional leadership pathways and how that in and of itself is racialized. Here we are suggesting to take another approach sit down with your team and reimagine what equity-minded qualifications could look like. As you can see, this tool is not about training, it's more about mindset. How can you reflect on your current way of doing this work with a racial equity lens? The table, which is table six in your toolkit, helps to start that conversation. It lists traditional approaches to leadership qualifications and then turns things upside down and helps you to think, okay, what would an equity-minded approach be to this same category of qualification? For example, if we look at the first row there, a typical qualification category that candidates are measured against is their leadership experience. This is typically manifested and measured by the number of years that they have served in senior leadership positions. What would leadership experience look like that was equity-minded? It might be experience creating or leading programs that advance racial equity, having a track record for hiring faculty of color and other practitioners that are equity-minded and race conscious, as an example. So finally, you'll see here an answer to the question, how does this tool advance racial equity? Simply put, by evaluating candidates for their leadership experience that is more equity-minded, you are better situated to evaluate how candidates can advance racial equity on your own campus. The last point I wanna make before turning the presentation back over to Regan is that we were recently given the feedback that our reports are very detailed, uh, the toolkit specifically. I mentioned this because it is important to underscore the criticality of details in this work. Racial equity can be quite abstract, but we have learned in our work together from this project, as well as other projects that focus on racial equity, that racial equity is in the details. And with presidential search, that is no different. Without dissecting presidential search practices, policies, and processes from a racial equity lens, we cannot know how it is missing, nor start to envision how it can be intentionally centered. And with that, Regan, I'll turn the presentation back to you. Thanks so much, Megan and Cheryl and Estella. So, you know, College Features Foundation is so honored to commission this work and thanks so much to the Ben Simone and Associates team for, for leading the research and, and doing this work. Um, and now I wanna turn it over to Michelle Siqueiros, our guest from Campaign for College Opportunity, because the next question is, 
what now? How do we ensure that some of these solutions are actually taken up and implemented? So Michelle, please over to you. Thank you, Regan. Thank you to the College Futures Foundation and obviously to Ben Simone and Associates for this powerful report. You know, the findings reminded me of something I heard Dr. Estela Ben Simone say several years ago. She said this, many believe that diversity is an ideal, yet not achieving it is acceptable. We need more than intellectual commitment to diversity. We need diversity related actions. Every one of us that has sat in a search process can attest to hearing the following. We care about equity, but we care more about hiring the most qualified candidate, no matter their race, ethnicity, or gender. As if their race, ethnicity, or gender don't add value and somehow most qualified candidate is a fully objective criterion. This College Futures Foundation report challenges these notions. It opens the curtain to the reality of our existing biases in these processes. At the Campaign for College Opportunity, our mission has been centered around expanding access and success for students and closing the persistent racial gaps that exist by race and ethnicity. Our own past research via our left out series of reports has highlighted that while our undergraduate student population is incredibly diverse, over 70% of students are Latinx, Asian American, Black, and Native American, the faculty and leadership are 70% white. So whiteness does rule in California higher education. Of course, what I appreciate about this report, about Dr. Ben Simone's work, about the leadership that Eloy Ortiz Oakley has had, is that we don't just discuss the data and the facts and lament the findings. We're here to discuss real opportunities to ensure a fairer and more diverse selection of college leaders. The toolkits in this report provide a path forward. Uh, these actions should include strong and transparent data on hiring. We have a lot of data on students. It's time that our colleges and universities are more transparent and public with their own hiring data. We'd like to know how diverse is your pool of applicants. We also wanna make sure that there are transparent and equity focused searches. Uh, the report highlights how to include and ensure that there's an inclusive search committee with members who are committed to DEI action and include uh, in the leadership profiles and job descriptions that we put out there a commitment to equity and a track record, not just a commitment, a track record that demonstrates leaders have done the work. We should determine whether or not a search committee is even necessary and useful. And if it is, ensure that that selected firm shares the same commitment to diversity that we do and that their search is inclusive. Uh, we also call for the creation of an explicit criteria for merit. Um, making sure these criteria include, again, commitments and a track record to equity and diversity, that we use rubrics to ensure more equitable treatment of candidates. In addition, we can build multiple points into the search process to evaluate the search committee's work to date. We should be looking beyond traditional pathways. The report talks about how great leaders can come from outside of the traditional academic track they shouldn't all just be coming from the academic affairs via vehicle. We need to make sure that diversity, equity, and inclusion are center, centered in the search announcement. And I don't want to end um, the call to action by uh, leaving our independent colleges and universities off the hook. They should and could be doing much better. While they are independent from our public university system, and obviously our public colleges have to be responsive to state needs given their reliance on state budget and financial aid, our independent colleges serve as many students as the University of California does. And they also receive significant infusion of Cal Grant funding. We should expect that they also have diverse leaders and a very transparent equity and inclusion focus. Finally, I just wanna say, especially in light of today's hearing uh, and arguments in front of the US Supreme Court on affirmative action nationwide, the ban on affirmative action here in California on Prop 209 
is not and should not be an excuse. In fact, this report outlines clear ways that searches can be more inclusive, transparent, and committed to a fairer process for all candidates. It has highlighted the many ways that these searches are not fair for women and candidates of color. If we truly believe in equal opportunity for all, then we'll reject processes that end up with the same results. Results that despite our talk about the value of diversity result in regularly hiring candidates claim to be the most qualified that do not reflect the richness of experience and talent that women and Black, Latinx, Asian American, and Indigenous leaders bring to the table. So with that, thank you so much. And I'll turn it back over to you, Regan. Thank you very much, Michelle. And I know we will hear from you again in just a moment. So we wanted to leave plenty of time for the Q&A. There's a lot to dig into here. If you're on the line and you have questions or comments for the panelists, again, please use that Q&A function and send them to us and we'll get to as many as we can. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there are so many on the call who hold pieces of this puzzle and are in positions to advance change around the topic. That's why there's a toolkit that goes along with the research report. It's because that implementation, that change in solutions piece is so critical. We all know that there's an issue with diversity and now how do we change the landscape? Um, before I get to the questions, I just want to mention the report and the toolkit are available. They are live on our website, so you can find them through our homepage, which is collegefeatures.org, or the direct URL is collegefeatures.org slash whiteness rules report, and I will share that on the screen um, towards the end, of, the end of the Q&A as well. Folks also asked if they could get the slides, the webinar recording, and other resources. And yes, we will send those out to folks who attended. So thanks for that question. So now I'm going to turn it over to our panelists. Um, and a couple of the, the first questions we got. One, could you speak a little bit more to the demographics specifically of the community college presidents or chancellors? Uh, the question specifically was around percent Latino. And also, uh, what's the role of executive search firms here? They carry enormous influence. So can we talk a little bit about that? So I, I'm thinking we'll probably start off with Estella, but Estella, anybody from your team? I think that, yes, thank you. Uh, the question regarding the community colleges, I am going to uh, turn it over to both Megan and Roman uh, to respond to. Uh, uh, Roman Liera was actually the person who led the uh, research on the community colleges. Um, I think that the other question you mentioned was the role of search firms. And I'll just uh, briefly respond to that. Yes, we spoke to uh, 10 individuals representing nine different uh, search firms. And uh, search firms also need to reform themselves in terms of how they go about this work. The search firms, for the most part, are also predominantly white. And uh, they often seem to focus more on have, having a diverse pool, but not necessarily always going the next step towards uh, developing the capacity of uh, search committees to be more critically race conscious. Uh, we found that the kinds of trainings that they do for search committees are typically on things like bias, but it's like maybe a one hour training session and it's very much in the abstract, not in, in relation to the actual practices of the, uh, of the search committee. So we do address that more fully in the report. Megan, since you interviewed search firms with me, is there anything else you want to add to what I just said? And then we'll turn it over to Roman. Uh, no, I think that um, the only thing that I would add is that there there was a tendency to have um, a lean towards this notion of objectivity in the search, and that that had been that's that was a, a throughput in the interview findings of our of our work. This notion of you know the process is fair, and so I think that much of what we're advocating for the um, institutions and the systems to do, which is to reflect on their own process 
in detail is what we'd also suggest to search firms as well from a racial equity perspective. Yeah, um, and I think that what we're also saying is that search firms themselves, they need their own professional development on how to become more race conscious. And uh, Roman, do you want to respond to the question of community college? Uh, yes, th thank you, Stella. Uh, Reagan, if, if it's possible, could you uh, put up the PowerPoint slide on slide number 25, just to highlight the percentages, not just within the community colleges, but also across the three sectors. And while, while uh, I think it was six. Yes, we'll do that. Just, right. just one minute. Yeah, no problem. So. Um, not necessarily to go into the details here, and I'll leave it here for you to, to observe it, but I do want to highlight the second point to the question as it relates to uh, specifically presidents um, and the differences. I think it was a question around um, non-presidents, more chancellors, but specifically one of the things, yes, uh, a couple of things to highlight here within the community college sector. They're structurally, they are different depending on the district, right? Different sizes, some are single districts, some are multi-districts. However, culturally, uh, these ideas of whiteness and whiteness rules are very much intact and operate in very similar rates across the sectors. Uh, for example, some of, some of the things here that, that at least stood out to me when I was talking to the different uh, presidents and collectively looking at the data was that uh, even though it's more open in terms of the community college sector in terms uh, for diverse career pathways versus what we call the traditional the academic pathway for the community college sector, uh, even though there may be opportunities to, to hire, uh, uh, presidents of color, even though things that break come to mind is that there's still an expectation to present themselves a certain way, specifically within the archetype of, of the white male president, but also for folks who are, are, are on, on the job, uh, there's um, the contextualization of their experience in terms of them being successful or being able to do the job that they were hired to do is very contextualized and political, meaning that who's on these, I think someone had mentioned the board of trustees, right? They play a big role in terms of like, how are they uh, supporting, but also how are they providing resources and support for these presidents of color? So it's also, and then also who's a faculty. So even though um, the structure may be different across the different sectors, uh, culturally there's whiteness that operates in very similar, but slightly different ways, depending on um, where the community college uh, system is, but also the politics around that space as well and then the people who are tend to be in the board of trustees, but also the, the faculty and their politics and their support or lack of for, for presidents of color. Thanks so much, Roman and, and Ben Simone and Associates. We have a number of questions that have come through about um, the role that boards play, um, both in the, the search and selection process itself, and then also post-hire in supporting leaders of color when they are hired. So um, I'm wondering if, the, I think all of our panelists could speak to this. So Ben Simone and Associates, I know you covered some of this in your research. Um, Eloy, I would love to hear from you as well in the, in the position you played as Chancellor of the California Community Colleges, if you could speak a little bit to where where you saw the barriers and, and what support mattered to you, what support uh, mattered to other leaders of color that you saw in the system. And Michelle as well, I think um, speaking to, you know, how, how we could hold um, boards accountable. So would love to hear from anybody who wants to jump in on that one. Well, I'm, I'm happy to jump in first. Um, so first of all, <clears throat> Uh, having spent time in the community colleges, having spent time going through searches myself, being part of searches, and also um, as a member of the Board of Regents for several years and seeing those search processes. Um, uh, there is um, an underlying um, expectation with boards that they will continue to do the practices that were handed down to them before. Um, and there is a reluctance to change the process because they see the process as um, set in stone. And to, to change it means, you know, having to deal with uh, an academic Senate or having to deal with the expectations of um, the college uh, president, uh, outgoing president or chancellor. So there has been a reluctance. I have seen in, in recent years, um, a push to change that, a push to change some of that culture, but it, it is difficult because it is really a culture. And um, sometimes we fall into individual choices as board members, as hiring committees 
but that is based on conforming to the culture that we've been handed down. And so that's the critical issue is breaking free of this culture, changing the culture, changing the expectations and asking uh, and demanding that uh, governing board members take a hard look at that culture and do what is necessary to change it. And that may mean slowing down a process. That may mean um, having to deal with some very difficult issues on a college campus or a system office, but it is important that that culture change going forward. I'll turn it over to Estella or Michelle. Michelle, do you want to take that? Well, one of the things that I um, really appreciate about the report and what Eloy just shared as his experience is that, you know, what you really call out, right, Dr. Ben Simone and, and um, your colleagues, is that we do put value and merit on things that are inherently white. And we've not been brave or courageous enough, I think, to confront that, right? So that when we are talking about diversity, equity, and inclusion, Often other folks think that we're talking about bringing down qualifications versus what I think is actually happening is that the, the process as established is, is not a fair process for all candidates. And it's not a fair process and we're not calling out that unfairness. We are just presuming that because a candidate has come through academic affairs and, and been dean and provost, then absolutely they are qualified to lead and vice versa, right? You talk about how these candidates are perceived as safe versus candidates of color or women who are not seen as safe. Um, and so there's a lot of coded um, uh, objective, right? Uh, hap uh, objectivity not happening in these searches. And so how do we really um, aggressively push towards that. And I do think that data is, is important, but I, uh, I think that making sure that we review the processes. I have, you know, the, the college presidency today is very different from what it was 50 years ago. And while, you know, I, I don't have anything against incredible academics being presidents and chancellors, I do think that the job today of managing a large university and organization, of fundraising for that organization, of building public awareness is a different job. So when faculty um, have set an outsized role in a, a search process, you are gonna get the bias of faculty wanting a, a rigorous academic, right? To be the next chancellor of the UC. I do recall in a public setting of the UC Board of Regents when the criterion for the next chancellor of the University of California was discussed and one of the regents responded and it was not Regent Eloy Oakley, but one of the regents asked, well, by these qualifications, it seems that President Obama would not be qualified to be chancellor of the University of California. And the answer from the representative was, that's right, he would not be. And so it, it speaks to how someone can be qualified to lead a nation, have had that experience and not be viewed as uh, qualified. Again, I think it speaks to the fact that, you know, our, our definition of what's qualified or not um, is not objective ever. And so maybe we need to own that. I, I think that the question has been answered. So Regan, in the interest of time, maybe we could go to other questions. Absolutely. So there's one question about how do you define whiteness and can you expand on this a little bit? Okay, well, maybe, maybe I will start with that. Uh, so whiteness is not so much about the color of skin, but it's more about processes, processes that, as, as, as Eloy mentioned, have uh, been calcified for years and years. And, uh, and what we don't realize is that those processes were designed at a time when higher education was predominantly white and therefore those routines and those practices that are repeated over and over and over again, we don't realize that in fact, they, they do favor 
individuals who have had those traditional opportunities that typically have gone to whites. So when we say whiteness, we're using it in, in many different ways. We're using it in terms of how whiteness can be a credential, what, but particularly how whiteness is embedded in the processes that, that we never assume to be racialized. We think that these processes are objective. The job description is objective. The kinds of interview questions are objective because we ask the same questions of everyone. But the fact is that, in and, and Megan said this really well, she said, in order to be able to get to racial equity, we have to look at the details. And when we look at the details, we see how they can advantage um, white candidates and, and whiteness becomes itself a, 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 a quality. And so, um, and our, our presidents of color that we interviewed, and we interviewed, I, Megan can probably give you the exact number. They all talked about this, this, this expectation that your mannerisms make white search committees and white boards comfortable. And, uh, and, and, and we document that throughout the report. So I think we need to talk about whiteness and we don't talk about it. We talk about diversity and equity often without talking about the, the role of whiteness as a quality, uh, as a privilege and, um, and, and so on. So I don't know whether um, anyone else, uh, the, you know, the other thing about whiteness is what, what's preferred in terms of experience. One of the things that we never heard was that, can, that presidents of color were asked, what was their experience in addressing issues of racial climate, uh, issues of racial affirmation of students, of be, having the skills to diversify the faculty. So that's another way in which whiteness works in the kinds of questions that are asked and the kinds of experiences that are valued. And I'll just say one more thing. Uh, Michelle said that you know, higher education is changing, and it is changing. The higher education of today, particularly in California, is not the one of a decade, two decades ago. And, and so we need college presidents who come with not only academic credentials and experience, but we need presidents of color or presidents in general that actually can address the urgent racial equity issues that our campuses are facing, particularly right now, as the Supreme Court is uh, hearing the, 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 the University of North Carolina case and Harvard University. You know, and I, um, I, I was listening to it earlier this morning, and one of the discussion was, what could be the alternatives, right, to affirmative action? What we need now, we're gonna need, uh, presidents of color who can think of alternative ways of being able to continue with our racial justice journey. Uh, anyone? Stella, you went off uh, mic there for a minute, but I think you were inviting anybody yeah. else. Who anyone wanted to else talk from, about. Yeah, anyone else from the team wants to talk about how whiteness is, what whiteness means? I think that was the question. I think maybe less how it means and one other way that I don't think we've talked about so much that ha that did show up in some of our interviews is, you know, as Estella mentioned in her summary of how whiteness showed up, you know, there was like kind of the performance, the aesthetics, like the, the accents, like all of these things were kind of indications of a preference uh, for either white attributes or white qualities. But one other thing that did show up, which was interesting is, now, even in the community colleges, like we know over the last 10 years in California, maybe even longer, there's been a lot of, um, I think, external pressure from the system office as well as the legislature to focus on equity and student success and specifically racial equity as a key piece of that. 
Um, but what we did hear from some candidates and, and presidents of color is that there's sort of like a way to do equity that doesn't ruffle too many feathers. And that if you are a little too out there, too radical, too justice oriented, too critically race conscious, you could actually be dismissed as a viable candidate, even in the California community colleges. And on the flip side, what we did see um, with some of the presidents of color in the other systems is that they kind of did, they did a really good job in terms of doing sort of diversity and addressing issues of underrepresentation, for example. So maybe they had a track record hiring um, women of color, um, black scholars, expanding the number of black graduate students like in STEM fields. Uh, but in addition to that, like that was kind of like the, a side, in, in a way, like a kind of sidecar thing that they did and they happened to do well. But the thing that probably really got them the job was the fact that they had this really traditionally strong qualified CV in all of these other ways. The fact is like the equity work is not enough to get you a presidency. You have to do it well, you, and you have to do it a particular way. And what we don't actually say in the report, but effectively is a white way of doing racial equity. Thank you so much, Cheryl. I We have another question that's come in and, and it ties to, to several others that have come up. And I think Eloy, given your professional experience and Michelle also the, the work that the Campaign for College Opportunity has done around faculty diversity, I'd be curious to hear from the two of you on this. And the question is, faculty members tend to have a significant influence on which candidates for president and chancellor, right, because this research applies to certainly to much more than, than presidential roles, are given most serious consideration, particularly by the UC and the CSU. And um, Dr. Rall, you may wish to jump in as well. I know you have um, some expertise on the CSU. How do you suggest addressing the faculty bias towards having presidents who follow the traditional academic pathway? And, and that last piece has come up in a number of other questions around um, what is the pathway, the professional experience that we're looking for? Not, when I say we, I mean this the standard process that's in place is sort of privileging over other um, pathways to the presidency. So Eloy and Michelle. Sure. Um, so we could literally take the whole day to talk about this very question. Um, but uh, uh, to try to cut to the chase, I mean, first of all, um, it's sort of a chicken and the egg. In order to see changes in the classroom, to see changes in the staff, you need to have leaders in positions who are willing uh, to make those changes and understand the importance of making those changes. And so that is, I think, one of the biggest um, issues here is having people in leadership who understand what's happening on the ground with their students, who can reflect the experience of students and their communities that they serve and make the changes on a campus or in the system that need to happen in order for the college uh, or the campus or the system to better reflect the needs of students. So faculty are a huge part of student success. Faculty are a big part of hiring leaders, but faculty um, are one part of the process. They are not the only part of the process. So it really becomes up to boards to exercise their uh, responsibility to to represent all constituencies in their communities or in the state and make choices based on those needs first. Second, uh, it's been my experience, certainly in the community colleges, that academic senates are starting to understand the need to diversify their own leadership, but that takes time and that takes a partnership with leaders in the systems that encourage, that create space for that change to happen. So in my mind, while well, lots of changes are happening in higher ed, it doesn't happen at scale without leaders in positions who reflect um, the needs and experiences of students and who have the courage and support of their boards to make the changes that need to happen. So again, I believe um, diversity, inclusion, equity starts at the top, at the very top. And without that, it takes much longer for this to, to sink in and the changes um, don't always reflect the needs of the students that we're hoping to serve. 
I would add quickly, and then um, Dr. Rawl, I really would love to hear from you, but two things that, that I think a lot of, um, and Eloy said this, you know, um, the faculty role and input is critical and they must be part of the search process. They are absolutely instrumental to the institution. And we need to make sure that staff, that students, that community leaders are also part of the search process. And that's not happening enough or with uh, enough engagement. Um, and so that's one. Um, two, I think a lot of pre-work has to be done. The toolkits um, in, in this report are provided to do that. Um, you have to be thinking strategically about how you're going to run the search. What is it that you really need in your next leader? How can you ensure um, diversity, equity, and inclusion and a fairer process? And also, how can every one of us own our own biases, right? Because we are all part of the system that has said this is the, the kind of person that should be a college president. How do we challenge those notions? Dr. Rawl? Yeah, I, I would just add, regardless of how much we think that other folks, uh, you know, the faculty, the staff, and all of these individuals influence who the president is going to be, that ultimately is a decision of the board, right? Like on paper, no matter what you want to say, one of the research tells us that's the number one thing that they do is select, right, support, and monitor the president. And as we've seen in our nation today, and not necessarily dealing with race, but if also folks, you know, the board doesn't want a president in that position, that person will not be in that position. We see that recently with MSU. So we cannot overlook the severity of the role that the board plays, right? And and I think something that, and I know we're you know getting close to time that we want to think about whether we're thinking about the role that the, the board has to play, the faculty plays, um, even knowing that the outgoing chancellor sometimes can influence what's happening, search committees can influence what's happening, staff, the community, all these different things is that oftentimes these, these entities don't understand how they can influence the, the process, right? Like it it was very clear in our research that individuals who were very intentional were able to make that change, but we don't understand, they were not able to sort of translate that into a, a, a system, right? And that's sort of what our report talks about is how we need to embed this equity mindedness into the system of how chancellors and presidents are selected. And we cannot rely on one one person, two people on the board and the presidency or, or any of these different um, areas in order to make the change. Like it has to be embedded in all facets. And so I think, you know, what Eloy, what you're saying about the culture is also important. Some institutions, the faculty does have more of a sway than other institutions institutions, right? But in other places, it might be the board who has even more of a sway formally and informally, right? And so I think it's just a long road ahead. And this is our report is just a drop in the bucket, right? Like, and what's going to happen in the future. So thanks. Thank you so much, Dr. Raw, for chiming in there. And um, if we could pull up the next slide, we are out of time for the Q&A, but there are many more great questions and comments. Would love to get to them. Uh, and more importantly, you know, we would love to hear from all of you about your ideas and also enlist your help in sharing the materials. The folks who are on the phone today are in excellent positions to help ensure that some of these practices and policies and cultures around this issue change. And so please, you know, in addition to sending us your ideas, be the one to share the research and the toolkit, be the ones to say, hey, is this, are we doing this? Are you doing this in your processes? As those positions open up, please share with anybody that you know who's a part of this, this puzzle. Uh, I'm sharing the contact information here for uh, Dr. Chase and Dr. Ben Simone, if you have questions for the researchers, any questions or comments about the broader work, please send to me. I'm there on the right, Regan Douglas. You can see my email and phone number information. The report and the toolkit are public today, so please feel free to post them on social media and tag us. You can see the URL down there at the bottom. And I just want to say thank you again so much to all of our panelists and to all of our attendees today. Really appreciate you being here. Have a good day.